All right, then, if you have your Bibles, we'd ask you to turn to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 50. And uh, while you're turning there, pray for our church. Um, we need uh, protection from the world. Uh, uh, the um, devil's good at setting his beat against us, and uh, that's uh, uh, his business. That's what he likes to do. Jeremiah chapter 50 in the very first verse. The Bible says, The word of the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet, declaring ye among the nations, and publish, and set up a standard, publish, and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken, Baal is confounded, Merodach is broken in pieces, her idols are confounded, her images are broken in pieces. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness and your watch care to our church. Lord God, we praise you for that. Uh, we pray you, uh, We pray for the ministries of the church. Lord, we pray for Jarrett and we pray uh, for Brother Kenny, Lord, that you would put them in places, Lord, where that they can be of service to you. We pray uh, for the potential opening uh, in West Tennessee. God, we pray that you would bless that. No doubt those people uh, need to hear the true gospel. Uh, bless in what we do and say tonight, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, uh, somewhat familiar verses of Scripture. Um, and Jeremiah is an exactly encouraging prophet. Uh, time and time again, he pronounces judgment against Israel and judgment against idolatry and judgment against sin. Now, if that makes you hallelujah, then Jeremiah's a good place to read. But if we'll be honest, most of it don't most of us don't like it because it gets too close to home. Right. And that, that that is the problem. And so as Jeremiah is beginning one of his final addresses to uh, the nation of Israel, he begins to uh, to address a very common problem that's always been among God's people, and that's idolatry. Idolatry is a very real thing, even today. We think we're pushed it aside. We think that we're not uh, that we're not involved. But this is what I have found: the biggest idol you face is when you look in the mirror every morning to fix your hair, because you like things your way. You like things to always go your way. You like things to be in a nice way toward you, and that is the worst idolatry there is. And so we as the Lord's people, you know what gets rid of idolatry? Being genuinely humble. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we can all play humble, can't we? Yeah. But when it's genuine, it's, it goes a little deeper, don't it? Uh, you know, uh, we as the Lord's people, you know what keeps people from following the will of the Lord? Not being really humble. Now, when you say that you have found the will of the Lord, certainly it shouldn't matter where, it, where it's at or what you're doing or how you're going to get there. It's being humble to the will of the Lord. Now, notice what Jeremiah says. He, first of all, he, uh, he verifies that this creed comes from God. It's not what he's saying. It's what God is saying. And when, uh, Brother Jared, uh, uh, Brother Kenny, when you get up and preach, you be sure that you have the mind of God and not the mind of Jared or not the mind of Kenny, that you have the mind of God when you get up and preach the Word of God because see what's going to happen if you don't, it's going to blow up in your face. Uh, you know what, uh, I've been doing this long enough, I'll admit, I, a couple times I've got up with my baby set on somebody, and you know what happened every time? I'm the one that become the laughing stock. So uh, if, if we approach the pulpit with humbleness, God will bless it every time he's faithful to do that. So with the mind of God, he addresses a number of nations. First of all, Babylon. Hmm. I believe that to be the Catholic Church. It was a type of the Catholic Church. It, it started out as a real nation, but you will see the judgment of the great whore in the book of, the, of Revelation that she's addressed again. Now, what Babylon is the very symbol of is idolatry itself. 
Now, we're going to go into some detail tonight, the Lord being our helper. Listen, we're about in the most idolatrous season that's coming up. A lot of people don't say, you know, people that I used to know that rejected Christmas is embracing it again. Mm -hmm. And you know what it is? It's because they they don't want to be make a bump in the road. They don't want to be upsetting to anybody. They're afraid they'll have as few as New Testament does. But you know what? That's an idolatrous season, and we need to treat it as such, and we need to teach it as such to the third and the fourth generations. Listen, we don't have anything to do with that. Uh, we don't need to. We don't need to say it's okay. Uh, uh, and not be embarrassed to say that. You know, a lot of people are embarrassed to say, hey, I don't celebrate Christmas. We ought not to be that way, have we? Right. Um, and, and so we see as the Lord's people that idolatry comes in many, many pieces and forms. And the, word, uh, and the word that the Lord spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by, Jer uh, by Jeremiah the prophet. Declare ye among the nations and publish. See, the idea of a missionary spirit is not new, is it? Even way back to the days of Israel, they were to, they were to preach the word of God. They were to get it out. They were to publish it. You know, a lot of people say you had to be born a Jew. You know that's not true. Uh, people could convert to Judaism. They had to go through the circumcision, and they had to take on, embrace the law, but they could become Jews if that's what they wanted to do. And, and, and so we find then uh, that God's people were to be a separate people from the beginning. You know, a lot of people uh, wonder why I harp on that so much. Well, that's always been the standard of God's people, to be different than the world, to be different and set apart and separate from this present evil world. And so he begins to tell them, declare ye among the nations, publish, that means get the word out, set up a standard. Now what is a standard? Well, well, uh, that's the benchmark for measurement. In, in, in our system, in our, our United States at least for now, we have an English method of measurement. It has inches and foot, and uh, it has uh, yards, and, so, and it's about gone. You know, uh, I never thought I'd live to see the day in nursing, but larger hospitals and measures are temps and Celsius now. And I have to get out and try to remember what Miss Link told me about the conversion table, because see, I still think it's fair or not. But there's a, but there's a measurement for everything, is there not? We as the Lord's people, uh, we're missing the mark. We're being driven by the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. We're being driven what we measure as success and not what God measures for success. And we need to get back to that standard, what he has set up, what he has said, this is right and this is wrong. You know what? Killing your babies is wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, men marrying men and women marrying women is wrong. Them sodomite couples adopting children and bringing them up in that mess. You know what it is? It's wrong. There ought to be a standard against that. And you know, one time there was. But we've let it go. It's about gone. And, and you know, uh, th this all comes, and this is why I'm such a homeschooler advocate and Christian school advocate, is because it always gets back to schooling. Yeah. That's right. It really does. It's what you're taught. It, it's what is... You get, and listen, when they spend seven hours a day in a public school and only three or four of you at night before they go to bed, listen, you ain't got the time to yeah. set the standard. That's right. Amen. They're nine and a half hours in the day, right? And so then we as the Lord's people, we need to understand and know that, that we um, need to have a standard among God's people. Then he says, after setting the standard, publish, publish that standard in. On our website, uh, on our uh, Facebook page, there, there is a statement of what we believe here at New Testament Church. You know, you know why we got it on there? We want to set the standards. If you don't want to embrace that, the best thing you can do is not come, right? And, and, and that's not real popular teaching, but that is what Jeremiah was saying. Let's stand, set a standard and let's stick to it. 
You know, it wasn't too awfully long ago when most of the churches in our uh, in our assembly, in our fellowship assembly, pretty much believed exactly what we did. And not only did they preach it, they practiced it. Yeah. But not anymore. Mm-hmm. And you know why? They're afraid they're going to lose a few dollars. And what we need to do is practice. Practice, practice, practice. And, and so... Jeremiah says we need to get this out, we need to publish it, and that's whether through speaking or writing or via the internet or whatever, let's get it out there. And so then he says, conceal not. You ever had the uh, impulse to not say anything just to let it go? Because see, that's a lot easier than saying, you know what, that ain't right. This is what the Bible says. You know, I had a friend the other day, dear friend at work, probably one of my favorite persons that I work with, and I had made a statement about sodomites, and it was on my Facebook page. He goes, oh, you better not do that in the of God. And I said, well, I was looking when I found this one, <laughs> and his eyes got to look that big. See, they're so trained. Young people are so trained that they would never imagine giving up a job for what that's right. But we need to get back to that, don't yeah. we? And so we find we find it in the Word of God that Jeremiah emphasizes the, to the people, set the standard, stick to it, and preach it. Say, Babylon is taken. It's gone. It's captured by somebody else. It no longer exists. Babylon is taken. Baal, or also called Baal, B-A-A-L. Baal is confounded. Merodach is broken in pieces. Her idols are confounded. Her images are broken in pieces. In other words, the idolatry of these nations are completely gone. Now, to get rid of idolatry, and this all did come to pass, just like Jeremiah predicted, to get rid of it, you got to know what idolatry is, don't you? Mm-hmm. You, you know, uh, if you're all caught up in clothing, be careful what you wear. And, and listen, you don't have to have nice, nice clothes to be caught up in it, do you? Uh, you look to man, I really wish what I had what she had. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's idolatry. You can be wearing a potato sack and still be idolatrous. And so then we as the Lord's people, what we need to do is identify in our life what what is that idol that we worship, that we want more than anything else, and is it in our way? And I would say most definitely it is. Now, look with me in 2 Kings. (coughs) 2 Kings uh, chapter... Number 23. 2 Kings chapter number 23, beginning in verse 17. The Bible says this Then he, meaning Josiah, then he said, What title is that that I see? And the men of the city told him, It is the sepulchre of the man of God, which came from Judah and proclaim these things that thou hast done against the altar of Bethel. Now, again, I want you to think about what do you preach? Now, Jared and Kenny and I, uh, it's pretty usually obvious what we preach because we can verbalize it. But listen, what do you preach in the home? And what do you preach on the workplace? You know, uh, Brother Kenny's got a job at least right now where he can influence a great number of people. And the thing is, what do you preach in there? Does it differ from what you're preaching here? Does it differ from what, you, what you're saying in other places? Because every day, ladies and men alike, you're preaching something and everybody's listening. Everybody's watching. You know, one, and, and it's not necessarily a good thing because most of the time they're watching so that they can see the mistake. Right. They're watching so they can bring off against you. 
They're, wa they're watching so they can say, see there? He, he is the problem. And, and so we find that in this case, Josiah asked about this grave is really what it was the testimony of this man, and it lived beyond him. Verse 18. And he said, let, the, let him, meaning this grave, this place, let, and he said, let him alone, and let no man move his bones. So they let his bones alone, and the bones of the prophet that came out of Samaria. And uh, what this really is, it's not so much about the grave and bones, is see, they had set a standard in their life while they were living, while they were doing things, and it wasn't going to be moved. You know, uh, when, when we're all gone from this place, there's going to be a testimony that you leave behind, and it will be that you stuck out to the end or you compromised somewhere along the way. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, among sovereign grace, independent Baptist churches that stick to the stuff, listen, we're getting few and far between. You're not going to be a big uh, Billy Graham uh, with 5,000 people in your church. But isn't that enticing? I mean, to the flesh, isn't it? Uh, wouldn't that be something to pastor a church with that many people in it? And you, you, you think about the stories that you've read of these huge preachers. You know what? That's an idol. That is an idol. Uh, and so we need to understand and know what's genuine service and what is simply idolatry. Uh, what, what, what is not really in service to the Lord. And so uh, they left those alone. They allowed the standard to stand. Verse 19, And the, all the houses also, the high places that were in the cities of Samaria, which the kings of Israel made to provoke the Lord to anger, Josiah took away. And, and did to them according to all the acts that he had done in Bethel. Now, if you want to know what he did at Bethel, read the front part of this chapter this week. But what he did, he burned it up and he ground it down. And the idols, he really, he literally ground to powder. You know, that's how sin needs to be addressed in our lives. Now, it's easy to say, look out here, man, you look at that bunch of Baalists down at their temple, and you, and you look how she's dressed, and you look at how, how he's dressed, showing himself, but what about when it comes home to us? Are you dressing the way you dress to be seen and to be patted on the back, or are you doing it because you love the Lord? See, there's a huge difference, you, and you really can get caught up in that. Can, you know what that is? It's pious religion, and pious religion will send a soul to hell. Mm. And so what we need is some kind of genuinality that we may see the idolatrous heart that we possess. But let's listen, we often, we often have that hidden somewhere, don't we? Whether it's in our education, or our job, or a pastorate, whatever it may be, we have that somewhere hidden. And what it needs to be is coughed up and asked forgiveness for. So we see the young king in the bay, the best I understand at this time, Josiah was somewhere between 16 and 21, and he began to reset that standard and say, hey, we're not going to take it anymore. We're, we're not going to have that in the kingdom of God. We serve the living God. We don't serve these other idols. We serve God. Uh, you know how difficult that is to, to stand up to in the day which we live? Have you ever seen an idol? Now, uh, I've seen a few, and they come in very different forms. Mm -hmm. When we uh, were in Mexico with the crafts and the chicken ball, not chicken ball, but uh, <coughs> Oaxaca, they took us by one of the the huge Catholic cathedral there in Oaxaca. And it was just un it was just unbelievable. And on the very same token, you had beggars out before it. So it was like, you, you know what that building was? It wasn't a place to house God's people. It was an island. And then we went up on the mountains of Oaxaca, and we got up there. At first, especially the first time, there were shacks, literally shacks put together. No electricity, no one running water, cooking on an outside fire. That was, that was the standard. And there in the midst of all that was this huge Catholic temple. And that is what they worshiped. 
Now, anybody here besides a gospel concert ever been to a concert? Now, unfortunately, I have to say that I have. And looking back, it was sickening. Uh, I won't say all the groups that I went to see, uh, but they were ungodly. And looking back, I see that that was the most idolatrous event that I had been to. And probably the worst one was Motley Crue. And y'all can Google that when you get home. But, I mean, people just going crazy. I mean, you would think they were in the presence of the Almighty. And they were burning incense to Baal in more ways than one. And uh, that's an idol, is it not? Is that not an idol? Absolutely it is. You know what Elvis Presley was? He was an idol. Uh, and we need to understand that in our life. Uh, you know, and I, I've seen this too, even among Southern Gospel groups. Uh, the people who worship as idols. One guy that I love, that I've seen people take it too far, is Big Jam Hamill. He's gone on home to be with the Lord. But they they were just crazy. And he was a very kind man. Adam told him to shut up one time. I was like, I don't know what he said. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but he's like, and so, when you begin to think about removing idols from your heart, it don't have to be a thing. It can be a person. It can be an individual that you respect so greatly that, that you know, there's a great deal. There's not much difference between respect and worship, is there? And sometimes we cross that line. Individual that you love so much that you begin to take them over other things. And so... We find this young child king comes in, makes a standard, and says, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to follow in these ways. Verse 20. I mean, excuse me, verse 19. Verse 20. And he slew all the princes and the high places that were upon the altars and burned men's bones upon them, and return to Jerusalem. Now, I want you to see, not only did he take care of the idolatrous places, he had to take care of the idolatrous people. You know, some people are in such a big enthusiasm to get people in, they'll compromise their standards. You know what? That's not getting rid of the problem. That's making you a compromiser. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we should not accept world has to offer. If they don't believe it, let them go. Amen. You know, that, that that's hard stuff, ain't it? And, you know, you know, I think the worst thing about Armenian teaching is this, is to judge yourself by your numbers. I mean, look around. I'm 21 years old. You know what? I had opportunities time and again to compromise. But what, what would it have gained me? You know what? If this building was full and we had the folding chairs out, probably be the result of compromise. What we need to do is stick to the standard. That, that's all that Jeremiah said was set, set a standard. And not only set a standard for your church, set a standard for yourself. Mm -hmm. This is what I'm going to stick with. This is what I'm going to do. And if I have an idol within my heart, would God that I cast it out even tonight? That's what we should do. Verse 23, but in the 18th year of King Josiah, just an 18-year-old boy, but in the 18th year of uh, King Josiah, wherein this Passover was held in, or held to the Lord in Jerusalem, Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits. Now, it's not in there anymore, and, and I don't even see uh, the Stewart Houston County Times anymore because I, uh, I got right with God and just get the Stewart County Standard and leave that bunch to herself. And, um, but y'all remember when we were kids, the horoscope was in there. And, man, I see people just, and I, I don't even know what I am. Uh, you know, I know it's something about, it ain't exactly the month of the year, but it's just some kind of foolishness. 
And man, they took that for gospel truth. Mm -hmm. You know what that is? That's a type of witchcraft in the Word of God. But it should not be named among us. And you know, even further than that, we shouldn't we shouldn't embrace it and say it's okay. We shouldn't say, hey, you know, that's just, that just, oh, it's foolishness. It won't hurt nobody. Yes, it will. It will cause them to set the wrong standard. It will help, It will hurt them. Moreover, the workers with familiar spirits and the wizards. Listen, if you don't think, uh, if you don't think uh, witchcraft is a real thing, wake up and smell the roses. It, it, it's morning because, listen, witchcraft is just alive in Stewart County, Tennessee, as it is in Atlanta, Georgia. They're all over the place. And what we need to be is acutely aware of them so when they walk in, we'll know who they are. See, we got to set a standard. You know, we just got through Halloween. That's the most uh, ungodly thing that you could ever imagine. We don't need to be named among God's people at any time. Uh, I've told you many of them, but I, I know uh, uh, Brother Kenny hadn't heard it when when I was, when we were in school at Martin at lunchtime. My freshman year, me and Donna always met. Adam was already born, and we'd go eat lunch together. And one day I came down from. Uh, my English class, and Donald's sitting there, there's a fellow there talking to her. Don't talk to anybody. And uh, he had on a black top hat, but it's kind of leather. Had an earring in one ear, and she had the baby in there. And he said, what sign was he under, born under? And Donald said, oh, I don't know, he was born in July. I told him his birthday, I was like, shut up. And uh, four is all over, what are you saying? Does he sleep in the same bedroom with y'all? And I took down by him to call. See, uh, and that was October the 15th. See, we don't realize the reality of the junk. They didn't want that boy. And that was 30 plus years ago in Little Weekly County, Tennessee. It wasn't in New York City. See, we need to be acutely aware of how people are out there, don't we? And, and, and set a standard. You know, it's not a popular thing to say, hey, I believe in witches and we're not going to have any part of that. People think you're stupid. But you know what? We've got to set a standard of some kind, don't we? But we say, hey, that's not right. That, that's not the way it ought to be. And, and so we find that in, in setting this standard, many times you're going to ostracize yourself from other people and you're going to find things within your own heart that you would, uh, that you certainly need to get rid of. Notice what else. And the images. Now that's the season we're approaching. You, you know what, of all the images that are out there, the one that Catholic Church produces that I that detests me the, the most is Jesus on the cross. Right. Listen, he's not on the cross, he's not Amen. defeated. He is not defeated. He's victorious. Amen. He overcame death and the grave. He's up there sitting at the right hand of the Father until something really good happens and someone stands for his name and then the Bible says he stands up. He, he stood up and welcomed Stephen home, didn't he? And, and, and so we, we as the Lord's people, we don't need to be involved in that right. in any way. Uh, he's not a baby in a manger. Right. That's it. He's a victorious God. Yeah. He's over all things that's under his feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Uh, you know what? He didn't worship trees either, did he? How brave are you going to be to say, listen, I don't do a Christmas tree, and the reason why is Jeremiah 10, 1 through 4. That, that's the reason I don't do it. Are, are you willing to set a standard? And listen, you're going to be called stupid. You're going to be called, oh, you're just being difficult. You're going to be called a Russellite or Jehovah's Witness. You set those standards, people will get mad at you. Mm -hmm. First time I said, Mom, we're done with Christmas, my my brother was stationed, stationed in Sicily. And she called him and said, Barry's gone crazy. <laughs> you know what? We've got to set a standard, don't we? Just set a standard. Mm -hmm. Live by it. Cut it out. Keep it for your own. And look for those idols in your own heart. Now, the idols that they took care of that Josiah got rid of were very obvious, were they not? 
They were literally things that you could pick up and say and touch. We think about the kind the Catholic idols that are out there. You see baby Jesus in the manger and you see the Christmas trees that are out there. You see all that stuff. But see what's most dangerous to God's people are the ones we can't see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The ones that are not tangible. But yet they're just as much of an idol as anything else. We really kind of get caught up on ourselves, don't we? Billy Graham, national figure, he's only been dead about six months. Some of people don't know that. He needs to be almost 100. And uh, his crusades, you know what that was? That was idolatrous. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a little secret about his crusades. When you came down front to ask your denomination and they sent you to somebody that knew that, that they weren't interested in the cause of Christ. Was interested in knowing person. Mm -hmm. And you know what that is? That's idolatry. Mm -hmm. and, and so we find that each and every one of us, none of us are above that, but let's see, our, our, our nature is bent toward being idolatrous. Our, our, our nature is bent <coughs> that we have to have some God. And one of the very first instances, I don't think it's the first instance, but one of the first instances, I mean, um, events in the Bible that talks that, remember when uh, Moses went up on the mount and they said to Aaron, up, make us gods. As for this Moses, we don't know of him. And you know, <laughs> I think Aaron was a politician, don't you? He said, he said yeah, I threw that stuff in there and the cat came walking out. Mm. Wouldn't even own up to it, would he? You know, that's how man is bent. Mm -hmm. We gotta have something. You know, it may be a truck, it may be a car, it may be a phone, it may be a house. But wouldn't God not you be rid of idolatry? Mm -hmm. That all that really mattered was that we could serve God. Mm -hmm. You know, I often think of Paul. Probably the benefit of his ministry is still being seen today. I, I know it is. When I, when I preach the gospel from Ephesians chapter 2, the benefit of his ministry still goes on even today. But you know what? He didn't want any glory for it whatsoever. And whatever his vision problem was, the Lord would take it for him. And he even said, I I'm glad he did. He says, if someone have glory, to gl if someone to glory with, do I not? Mm -hmm. And so what we need to be very, very cautious of is our ministry becoming an idol. That's something that we worship. <clears throat> I fully believe that's why Paul was a tent maker. When all the chips were down, just like me, I can go and take care of some old person somewhere and get, and get by for me and my family. You know, uh, and I, I certainly believe that we as the Lord's people, we should support our, our pastor the absolute best we can. Uh, the one that plows the field deserves to, be, deserves to be supported, but be very cautious of that. Because if this was my full-time job, <laughs> Somebody pop up and say, man, I don't like what you're preaching. If this is what me and my family is depending on, it would be very, very much to say, okay, especially if they have the biggest pocketbook in the church, be very careful of idols. Last place I'm going to read very quickly in the, the book of First John. And there's always a little bit of debate on the writer of these last books, but I personally believe it to be John the Apostle. I think this one particularly makes it pretty obvious. Um, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18. The Bible says, we know, we know, meaning him and the folks he was writing to, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now, that's one of the best, clearest, most distinct verses of eternal security you'll find. But read the rest of the sentence. 
We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. So if you're really begotten of God, yeah, you're going to make a uh, mistake now and again, but you know what? It's going to be troubled by it. Uh, Brother Kenny, uh, give me a book I'm reading on personal holiness. And you know what? It's right, it's right in line with this scripture. Because see, if you willingly sin, and you know what? I'm under grace, and I'm going to go up to uh, the bordello. I'm going to go into in with another woman, and it don't hurt you a bit. I couldn't be question mark on your salvation. <coughs> All right? And, and, and so we find then, as, as the Lord's people, that uh, he will bear witness and when we sin, he'll convict us of it. He'll make us sorry about it. And if we're not sorry, something's wrong. And the wicked one toucheth him not. And we may know that we are of God. We can know it. And that the whole world, the whole world lies in wickedness. That's what's out there. That's what, that's what the world has to offer. And we know that the Son of and we know that the Son of God has come and given us an understanding that we may know that it, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. That is completely grace to the end. Now notice, little children. Keep yourselves from idols. Amen. That's how he ended it all. That's right. He told them complete grace. He says, you keep yourself from idols. You be very cautious of those that are out there. And I would dare say, if we'd be real honest, uh, the biggest idol is looking back at us when we fix our hair. Um, you know, uh, me, Donald, talked about this a couple of times and I'm sure y'all know this as much um, know this as much as I um, I don't get invited to preach as much as I used to and I thought of that is that just because I preach the same thing or is what I preach getting old getting unpopular you know that can be offensive to the flesh the kids were young. I mean, we were somewhere at least every month, and sometime week by week. Uh, I don't need to let that be my idol, do I? Mm -hmm. Just stick with the stuff. Yep. If they invite me, good. If not, I'll preach to a handful of God. We don't need to be an idol unto ourselves. We need to just stick with the stuff. Mm -hmm.